Wow. Thank you. Um, I want to uh, thanks, thank everybody, Vanessa, Amada, the entire staff of the Phoenix Art Museum, Vicky and Ken Logan for sponsoring this series. And I, most of all, I want to thank you for coming in such amazing number to an artist lecture. I, you know, I know, I know in Phoenix you don't, sac I wouldn't sacrifice a beautiful day like this for an artist lecture in, in a lifetime. But then since you have so many beautiful days in Phoenix, I guess, you know, I understand that better. I, 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 I have to confess, I don't go to artist lectures because it's, you know, you know what I'm, I'm going to be doing here? I'm going to be talking about physical things, you know, a physical phenomenon, and I'm going to just do a lot of gesturing. You know? it's, a, it's pretty much like a, a, what a mime does. And that explains my, you know, my dislike of, for all mimes. I hope there's no mimes in the audience. Huh? Um, it is, a, you know, as I said, it's, it's a, what makes me be here to, you know, this is a very interesting dynamic. That one person talking to a lot of people. Uh, <clears throat> I try to think of what to make of that, you know, what brings me here to talk to you. And I, we'll, we'll get to this a little bit later. Because I have an answer for that, a very funny one, actually. But uh, um, I think one of the things that bring me here is like, the fact that we, you have a very interesting exhibition about Brazilian art. And in a very pluralistic, eclectic media environment that we live today, you know, what is it to be uh, from one place or another? You know, it's a very interesting and valid question that we should be asking. Um, I been doing all these things for, you know, I used to, you forgot one thing I did, I used to work as a bouncer in a roller skating rink. <laughs> yeah. I, I tried every single thing you know, that you could possibly try to do. I was a bartender, I did the, you know, I was an actor, I wrote plays. Until I, when I did everything, I said, well, that's the only thing left for me to do, I have to become an artist. Um, but I, I think, uh, uh, it's a, it's a, uh, I, when I, when I think about what is it that I do, you know, and I was uh, talking to, uh, to an interview before that, uh, why, why, you know, it's very easy when you're beginning as an artist, because what you want to be, you want to be, be an artist. You don't care about what you're making, but you want to be an artist, you know. By the time you're doing like this for over 30 years, you know, you have to, Ask yourself, what is it that I do? I'm already an artist. I'm making a living. I'm paying the bills. Uh, but what is it to be an artist? You know. And then it's a, it's a. And every time I do a lecture like this, is one of you, a very mean person, raise the hand and say, "What is art?" <laughs> and I cannot ever answer the question. You know. So, but then I, I, I suffered enough to the point that I come up with a very interesting answer. You know, <clears throat> art is the evolution of the interface between the mind and the existing environment, being that environment natural or social. You know. We develop tools to understand the world around us and create a relation between what's inside our heads and what's outside that comes through the senses. You know. And it's, a, it's, a, it's clearly an evolution that it, 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 we evolved our way of seeing things based on the techniques that we developed to understand them. Um, I bring, that brings my mind to a long, long time ago, about 60,000 years ago. You know, a guy walks inside a cave, and then he looks at something in the wall, and he goes, wait a minute, that looks like something I've seen before. You know, you probably had to see something to be able to recognize something in a different pattern to have this, to migrate the form of something to something else. And then he looks at it, and he goes, whoa, that looks like an animal. But not any animal. It looks like a, a bison. Not any bison. The bison that I hunted the last winter when we were all hungry and starving. And we threw spears at it. All that blood and the ice. And then the party that ensued. And then all the, the chanting and the happiness. And then he looked at it. It was just a crack on the wall. <laughs> so he picked up a, a, some, you know, blunt instrument. or some, they, they were no blunt instruments. He picked up something that was pointy. Went there and completed the drawing with a missing eye or a tail or a tusk. And uh, all of a sudden, 
all those memories came back again. This man was the first artist. And it's surprising, that didn't work just for him. When he called all his tribes member, you know, they looked at it and they could feel exactly the same things he was feeling. It was something that could be shared. The invention of representation is perhaps the most important human achievement after the control of fire. It was exactly the moment we could make a picture. You know, we could uh, not only uh, con con we, we can uh, leave knowledge for future generations, we could transmit knowledge, we could also in a sedimentary way, we could accumulate it into what we now uh, know as history. <clears throat> My answer about what art is, you know, is a very good answer. The problem with that answer is that it serves for what is science and what is religion. It's exactly the same thing. It's, you know, the evolution of the interface between mind and phenomenon, mind and matter, mind and environment. Because these three things were, at, once, at one point, they were exactly the same thing, you know. They were all about one thing that distinguished our species from any other species in the planet. Every single thing that is alive now, you know, as we go, the trees, the palm trees, the grass, knows something, knows how to survive, has a sort of knowledge that, uh, you know, solved evolutionary problems and it made it be here today among us. Our species, the one, you know, we have possessed a different kind of creativity that's not about solving problems. We can create problems. You know, we're very good at it. And we create problems that we can solve so we can figure out, uh, you know, we create models of existence that exist that they're not happening right now. And that we can, with those models, we can foresee things that haven't happened yet. Model making is something that we do and requires this one thing that we have that no other species has is belief. You know, we believe. Believing is something quite complicated. It relies on illusion. You have to fool yourself temporarily in order to believe something. Um, even the words that are coming out of my mouth now, they have certain significance to you because you believe, you, you make, but it's, if you just think of it as sound, you know, they don't mean anything. So uh, what, are, are the, what the artist does supposed to be doing today, you know. It's not different than what the artist did in the past, the guy who went into the cave and did those things. You know, what we're doing, we're just depicting the world in the, with the tools that we have available at this precise moment. Um, what Cezanne did when he took his easel to the field and painted the mountains around Provence, you know, he was doing it exactly that, and I do exactly the same thing. But when I've been to Provence, you know, the mountain Saint Victoire is not purple. But Cezanne saw it as purple. And he saw that we, the men at that particular time in history could see the purple in that mountain. Because, you know, painting had been recently liberated from the, its duty to portray real things, portray the world as we saw it, or we thought we saw it. You know? um, I think... Uh, uh, how did I end up with the, doing these things or having this conscience of, uh, or believing that I'm an artist that do an art that I can explain? You know? Then it goes back to what is being Brazilian. Uh, Brazilian art is a very difficult thing, and Vanessa probably had to be toying with that to describe. You know, we have a, a, sto a history that's happens in a, in a different time, in a kind of, it's always a little bit off tune with the, with the rest of what's going on around the world. Maybe because we're just distant or because we're just different. You know, we speak, we speak a different language in South America, which makes us really weird. Um, but weirdness is not something that we, we, we suffered from. You know, we don't, we basically ignore it. Um, when people ask me, when did I become an artist, I, I always, I, I remember being in a, in, a, in, a, in a conference like this. I remember every single time I was in a talk like this, because we weren't many times, I think. And uh, it was uh, actually a lecture, I'm not going to tell the name of the artist. Okay, it was Julius Schnabel. <laughs> and he said that he, he started painting at the age of five, you know. And I looked at him and said, who did it? You know, everybody. <laughs> But I, I, but I, I, 
I, I was like, but, but, that, but no, that was really interesting because it's not when you uh, start being an artist that comes, it's when everybody else around you stops being one. By the time you acquire, uh, you know, language of uh, symbolic exchanges, like, uh, you know, you start writing and reading, it's, it's almost all the time you start losing that direct relationship that most children have with the world. I just started a project in Brazil called Escola Vidigal. You know, it's a school for visual and tech literacy for kids in the favela. The reason I did that is because I told my wife, you know, I, I, I have four kids, you know, and they're responsible for everything that you're going to see in a little bit because I test them like guinea pigs. <laughs> I, I'm always showing them things, see how they respond because, uh, you know, they, I, they have a different relationship to the visual world that we have. By the time we start building too many structures, too many explanations, we live in the world of language, and even today, it's just like many dimensions of this language, you know, because we're dealing with it all the time. We started creating a, 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 a sort of like a, a barrier between that separates us from the real experience of, of the visual world. And this is when we stopped drawing. We stopped playing with uh, clay and, and doing things. You know, I, I, I wonder if how would be the benefits, the benefit of like continuing you know, uh, drawing and making sculpture in, in form of education, but having a holistic education that some people had, like maybe the last time we had this kind of thing, we're trying to re redo this now, but I mean, the, we work the two sides of the brain, you know? Uh, but this is, okay, I, I, I've got to like, I love the idea of education, but this is a subject for another lecture, but let me concentrate here. Um, okay. How did I start being an artist, right? Um, I, I, it has to be, since it's like everybody starts as an artist, you have to think of when did I first feel that I would, that would be the beginning of this story and what brings me to be here talking to you today. Uh, it's in 1965 in a sofa in a very poor household in, in Sao Paulo what they call the cortiso. It's like a sort of like an urban slam. I live there. My parents both work outside, and I'm sitting in a sofa, green, grayish sofa with my grandmother. She is actually, she's teaching me how to read. But there's a little thing. She, nobody ever taught her how to read. She looked at her children's book so hard that she deciphered it, you know. She learned, she taught herself how to read. Nobody knows how she did it. She's the most intelligent woman I've ever met in my life. She had not one day at school. Her name was Anna Rocha. The book is an Encyclopedia Britannica that my father won in a pool game. <laughs> he brought it home in a, in a, wheel, a wheelbarrow, you know. Uh, and she's had a technique. She would just put my finger through the words and just, you know, trace them like this. And you see the word would appear and disappear at the same time in a way that I could memorize the form of the entire word. And then it would be like Cascavel, Urutu. It would be names of snakes. And I remember the tactile effects of this uh, learning. Something that I could see, I could taste the word. You know, it was, it could, I could feel the words printed even. I remember that. When I started going to school, I was seven. I was already reading chapter books. You know, and I always loved reading. But... By the time, on my first days, first days of school, I realized that they didn't know how to teach me how to read like my grandmother did because I was a self-taught dyslexic person. I would memorize the entire word, but I could not understand the phonosyllabic system. So it took me three years to be able to write a word of my own. When I took dictations, when the teacher said, uh, you know, car, church, I would go, you know, draw a church, a draw a car, you know? And my books look like pretty much like the Egyptian wing of the Metropolitan Museum of Art, you know, <laughs> that they were hieroglyphs that I could only decipher. Well, those uh, codes, they started migrating to more, uh, uh, you know, elaborated drawings. And by the time I was 13, 12, I was the kid in school that drew caricatures of the teachers and passed them around. I was the kid... Everybody 
has a kid like this in the class, you know? But when, when you're that kid, you think that you're only one in the universe, you know? You think that you are the weird outcast that spends all the time drawing things. Well, one day, a teacher, I remember his name, his name was Belotto. He took my books, my copy books, and they were filled with drawings. And then he said, you have to talk to the principal. And I was like, oh, God. You know, so I, I went there, and it turns out, turned out that she, uh, uh, I was chosen to be uh, uh, the artist, to represent the school in a, in a little arts festival for public schools. That I, and I won first prize. I didn't care if I won first prize. That day was the happiest day of my childhood because I met kids that were like me, weird kids who drew. And I realized, you know, like it was like the, the, the planet of the apes. You know, when they come, they say, oh, I'm many. There's, oh, my people are here, you know. And then there you go. Uh, I remember and the best the outcome. I, I, I was so happy, you know, that there was this thing called art, you know, and people did it. And it was not some weirdness on my part. But the best thing is like after that, I won two-year course, <clears throat> I was 14, uh, to academic drawing. And I spent uh, the next two years of my life as a 14-year-old. Every afternoon, I would go to the school, draw naked people. I didn't miss one class. <laughs> I became very good at it. Well, when you draw... Um, and you, I had this very academic... No, nobody knew who Andy War, who was... Nobody had any knowledge of what contemporary, even modern art seemed like a very distant concept, you know. And, but the thing is, this was the time of the, we lived in a, in a dictatorship, military dictatorship. And at the same time, I was learning how to represent things, how to go in towards the perfect simulacrum, which is what we're all trying to do since the beginning of time, to make something that represents something else so perfectly that you'll be confused. So the image be just like the thing, you know. We may have arrived already at this point that we don't know how to differentiate, you know, fact from fiction anymore. You know, we finally achieved the goal of our ancestors, and we're desperately trying to revert the results of this right now. Uh, but at that time, uh, you know, we lived in a politically charged climate, you know, which is, sometimes you, you sense it in the exhibition that's in the museum right now. Uh, I am not a victim of the dictatorship. I wasn't exiled like some of my friends were, but uh, I'm, a, I'm a, a product of a dictatorship regime. When you have something like that, you cannot say what you want to say, just say, you know, because there's censorship. So you have to figure out different ways of saying different things. All of a sudden, language becomes a very elastic tool. And metaphor, we became very good at it, you know, in our songs, you know, we, we would be, you know, there would be like a, a very lovely, harmless love songs. Estava toa na vida, meu amor me chamou. They just talked about a band passing by. It is about a, a military band. It is, it's everything. If you could read through the words, that made you an intellectual. And it was really cool to understand what the words were saying. And all of a sudden, uh, the, is, you know, I was immersed into this political politically charged uh, brand of intellectualism, which at first fascinated me, but later I started being a little bit having difficulties with it, ideological difficulties with it. Well, most of my friends were reading Karl Marx, which was a forbidden book by the time. I was reading Marshall McLuhan. I was not interested in uh, ideology. I was interested in the mechanics of ideology, how people come to think like something, you know, and I'm still fascinated by it today. Um, I started studying psychology, but I wasn't a very good student, and I failed two, twice the, the exam for the psychology school of the University of Sao Paulo, and I decided to settle for something that I could use representation, psychology, many things, and I'd settle for advertising. Actually, what, was, what fascinated me about advertising is they had a book out called Subliminal Seduction that told about how people airbrushed figures like naked people in glass cubes in whiskey commercials to sell more whiskey. I wanted desperately to do that, you know? 
I want to fool people, play with their heads, be like some kind of like Svengali, like a hypnotist, you know. I want to make them buy everything, even things they don't need to buy. Basically, I didn't want to make anybody buy whiskey. I wanted, you know, what I wanted to do is make them buy ice cubes. <clears throat> I was more interested in practicing them. Uh, and then let me bring us to the, uh, the reason why I'm here talking to you today. Uh, on the first year of university, you know, I decided to conduct a self, uh, a, a, a self assignment. I could not read any billboard in Sao Paulo, none whatsoever. And I realized maybe it was because I was I've always been a little dyslexic, right? And then one day I, was, I took my mother to the bank and I said, Mom, can you read that? And then I just kept the speed and she said, no. I went around the block. 10 kilometers an hour less. And I said, what about now? She said, no, I still can't read it. So I went on basically until it was like everybody honking behind me. And I was like very slowly. I said, can you read it? Now I can't read it. So I, I made a note. For the next six months, I created a chart that crossed vectors of speed, angle of approach, and also the amount of text and font uh, in order to make the billboards more, uh, uh, the, improve the readability of billboards in the whole city. It had nothing to do with me. The billboards were insanely stupid. You know, they would just, uh, they would advertise for like a, a toy uh, in, the, in the driver's side on a, on a, with signs that were parallel to the road and a high-speed road. So you, you would have to be a driving baby who could, who could read backwards <laughs> to buy that toy, you know? I like... I realized I went to one of the people who did point to sale advertising in Sao Paulo. It was called Alvo, the target, you know. And I said, listen, I can't really help you with your signs because they're ridiculous. But I, if it, you hire me or you go to your, there are only two people, so you go to work for the other people. So he hired me <clears throat> and I became like an 18 year old consultant uh, with almost no pay, you know, but he gave me money for fuel, uh, which you know, I love driving around the city. and, and at the end of the year, the Association of Advertisers of Sao Paulo decided to grant me like a little trophy, you know, revelation of the year for the work that I had done. The day that I went to pick up the trophy, I rented a tuxedo for the first time in my life. I felt absolutely ridiculous in it. And I went to this event. I didn't know anybody. I waited until they called my name. I picked up this really ugly plexiglass trophy. And then I took another beer, went home. When I was going front, I, my car was parked in the back. When I was in front, a woman stopped my car. And she said, stop, stop, you have to help me. This guy is killing my fiancé. So I, I got out of the car. And they, in fact, there was one guy with breast knuckles hitting another guy on top of a car. They were both wearing tuxedos. It looked like a James Bond film. <laughs> so I, I went there and I pushed the guy and he ran away. And I, I said, okay, okay, and I proceeded to my car. The victim, thinking that I was his assailant, went into his car, picked up a gun, and shot at me, you know, because I was wearing a tuxedo. You have to think about it next time you wear a tuxedo. <laughs> well, luckily, uh, the shot wasn't fatal, as you can all see. And even more luckily, the guy was rich. So when I woke up, Three days later, the first thing I saw was my assailant, the, the guy who shot me. He was, had bandages all over his face. I thought I had died and gone to mommy hell. <laughs> but he said, I'll pay for the hospital bills and I'll give you some compensation money. It was with this money that I bought a ticket to come to New York in 1982. And this is the primary reason why I'm talking to you today. Because I got shot in the leg. So, now that, now, that we, now, that we did, now that we're clear why am I doing here tonight, you know, I'm going to show you some things. I just I didn't want to, you know, make you that, think that you're being lost this beautiful day and you're being fooled by somebody here. Yeah. Um, when I arrived in New York, I was doing theater at the time, and I was trying to write plays. And... Uh, but the, the, the theater in Brazil was based, we are from the generation that couldn't deal with politics anymore, so we're doing things that were very circus-like. We were, we 
we're into salting banks, the, the, the mechanics of theater, how uh, uh, one thing can be seen as another, you know? So my group was called Asdrubo Trosso Tromboni. It's a very famous group right now. They're 30 years around. And we would put like a, a, a row of blue buckets, fill them with water, and that would be a river. But that would require as much imagination from the people who made it than from the public. So it was a negotiation. We had to meet in the middle. And it was exciting to do that kind of theater. And when I arrived in, in New York, I wanted to do that. So I took courses in theater. I got it. I said, I'm going to work in theater. The fact that I, the, 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 you know, the, the theater at that time, it was the, what the, was taking most of its inspiration from the punk period, you know. So you had people like Richard Foreman. Uh, he organized plays where you would have like 35, you know, unattractive middle-aged men in the stage naked screaming obscenities for three hours. <laughs> you had that and then you had cats. <laughs> and nothing in the middle. So I gave up, uh, and for, for many years, I, well, all I did, I, I just, I, then I did more odd jobs. I was a bartender at the Michael Todd room at the Palladium, where they had beautiful Basquiat in the back. You know, I was looking at what art, how artists live, very glamorous. And I lived in the East Village, this rat-infested neighborhood that by convenience became an artistic mecca, you know, in the 80s. There's one thing that happens, you know, I know there's a lot of young people here. There's one thing that happens in your life that is, is unequivocally the most important moment. You know, I, I, I did some surfing. You know, I live in Rio. I, I, I like to say I do, but I don't. Uh, you know, that when the wave comes, you know, there's only one wave. You know, there was one moment that you realize that every single thing, all the novels you read in your childhood, all the films, the TV sitcoms, the music, the, 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 the discourse, everything amounts to the fact that when, at one point, the people who were subjected to the same culture, stop consuming culture, start producing a culture of their own. And that's your wave. When you sense that, you have to roll, battle really hard, because you want to catch that same wave. I sensed that in the East Village uh, when I was very confused. I, I, wanted to, I wanted to be an artist, but I, I, I loved art history. I loved everything about art. But I, was, I loved media. I loved mass culture. I loved things that spoke to millions of people. And I like to understand the workings of this, you know. And when I walked into a gallery and I saw Cindy Sherman film stills for the first time, nobody had to explain that to me. I had a, Yale, a girlfriend that was a Yale graduate. And I remember she tried to explain to me. I said, no. I said, I know what that is. I know because I am that person. I am a person who was probably the first generation of artists who lived under the influence of television his in my entire life. And I have a hard time differentiating how to locate myself between what's here and what's in the screen. You know, when I watch movies, I cry and I, I'm, I, I become that person. When the movie ends, for a little while, I'm still that person. And I'm very bothered by it, you know. When you watch like boxing films and you come out of the, the like, you know, like you know, that kind of thing. Or, at, you know, uh, Fast and Furious is terrible. You know, a lot of car accidents right after when you come out of the, So we're spoiled goods. We've been like receiving enormous amounts of information. We have no taxonomy, no method, no education that organizes that thing. You know, uh, I... It's felt that, you know, Jeff Kuhn's basketball posters, you know, uh, uh, Louis Lawler, uh, pictures of art that was, pictures of art as objects were very interesting. I had dinner with her yesterday, and we're talking about this, and we, I, uh, that generation was like, I see, this is the way, this is, I, I think I can do this, I can become an artist. But uh, uh, advertise, and I, I, you know, I, I, I teach, I, I used to teach in, in at Bard College, and I remember I like to teach freshmen, you know, and they're like this 18, 19 year old, like, what do you do? He said, well, my work is basically autobiographical, you know, it reflects my, what I lived my entire life. And I said, well, we haven't lived yet. How can you be big autobiographical? So at that time, I was, tw you know, 22, no, 27, still I hadn't lived anything except being shot and you know, other things, but I uh, lost at sea. That's a lot, another lecture. Uh, I, I, 
I said, you know, what is really, I, I bought, a, I, I rented a little studio, I painted white, I found this modern chair, really cool, you know, and I said, okay, now I'm going to make some art, okay? So I sat on the chair, art, come. And obviously, you know, it's not, art is not a thing. Art is a, it's not what you filter through life. I think artists are like filters, you know. You just go in the sediments that you collect is the art objects that you leave for posterity. Um, what did I really do? What was my interest? Advertising is something quite interesting. In advertising, you pick powders, liquids, uh, and, and you just give them uh, identity, you know. You create, you get the little liquid, make it look pink, put it in a, in a, in a little uh, bottle that looks like a woman because it's easy on your hands and wash your clothes gently, you know? <laughs> Things like that. So I, I, I kept thinking that what the relation between meaning and object, this has been a core mod, mod, modus operandi for my work for 30 years almost. It's there, you know? And I call this series uh, Relics. This is the clown school. It's a remnant of a race of entertainers that lived in Brazil a long time ago. This is the Ashanti joystick. It's so old. It's so ancient, it was made for Atari. This is the whole Encyclopedia Britannica, book binded in a single volume for travel purposes. <laughs> this is the pre-Columbian coffee maker. This is uh, the, psycho the, the uh, Tupperware sarcophagus. <laughs> That's a fake mummy in it, okay? But it, you can't imagine how fun it is to actually travel this piece around Europe and in the United States when you go through customs. <laughs> uh, this is the, you know, the nail fetish. And this is the half tombstone for people who are not dead yet. <laughs> so I, I made these works and started showing them. And not only a, a Swiss friend of mine that became my friend, an artist called, named Not Vital, he came one day to my studio and decided to buy all of them. But he also introduced me to a gallerist who gave me a show. You know, and and I, I could not understand why would people buy these things. Still, it was very <laughs> puzzled me. Uh, so, but that was my uh, beginning, you know, as a, as a career as an artist. There's something very interesting. When I showed these things for the first time uh, in a gallery, uh, everything was fine because I had, I was used to look at these things in the studio and I was making them, I was laughing, having fun making them, bringing people to look at it, laugh with me. But then one day they brought a photographer to shoot the pieces for documentation and for, you know, diffusion that they had to show this piece to and uh, this guy, his name is Peter Muscato. I remember his name, you know, because it was a mo very important moment in my career. He brought two students, two, two assistants. He had, like, a white background, lights. It was the Oscars for the work. You know, they, they, were, they would look at it. it was, they, the work was made for being photographed. Because, like, once the, the pictures were taken, I could just throw the works in the garbage because they were already, they had their moment of glory. But uh, I look at these pictures. There's something wrong with them. And you look at him and there's something wrong with this picture. Right? I don't know what it is. And when I don't know what something is, what I do, I try to do exactly the same. So what I did, I said, I want to take, I'm going to take the same picture, see what's wrong with this picture. So I went to the wrong place, bought the, my first time in my life, bought the wrong camera, loaded with the wrong kind of film, you know, shoot it under bad light, and took it to develop at the wrong uh, uh, one hour photo place. And when I picked up the pictures, they were right. It had to be something other than narcissism that make the perfect pictures from the professional photographer wrong and my pictures right. And I thought of it for a long time until I realized one thing. When, you know, uh, children and autistic people have an uncanny ability to rotate objects inside their, you know, the mental image. We lose that gradually as we start reading and writing. So when you imagine an object before you made it, you imagine from a specific vantage point. And then you build this thing, you materialize it, made it in the real world, and when you finalize, finally made it, you look around it, and when you see it exactly from the vantage point that you had imagined, a cycle, a circle is closed, and you're happy, right? That's why my pictures were right. 
because I was looking for the picture inside my head, the picture that existed before I actually made the works. The, the photographer had no ways of, of doing that. And I started thinking, obsessing about the picture in your head, you know? Uh, for many years, you know, I, I was doing this thing as a pastime. I had this book, the first book I bought it in a garage sale in New York, in Chicago, when I first came to the U.S. It was called The Best of Life. You have, many of you have this book in your shelves. You know, it's a book, it's a collection of Pulitzer Prize winning photographs that everybody knows, but still you buy the book. You know the pictures. Why you bought buy the book? Because just like a family, picture, family album, you have to look at these pictures from time to time so you reload your memory, you know? I lost the book. I, lo I took the book to a beach. I don't know why. And then when I came back, I, I, I thought, what do I know about this picture? So for many, for two or three years, I draw from memory what I remember from these very famous photographs. And I, every time, it's funny, because you draw, you draw something you, you don't, don't remember anymore. Next day, you look at it again, you draw more. It's sedimentary. It's very interesting process. It also teaches you about how your memory works. Like these pieces I had drawn as a child, it was easy for me to draw. Because I drew that picture many times, you know. And uh, pictures like this, I was surprised how well I did. But I was also surprised how well I did certain parts of the picture. Because people who are used, of draw, used to drawing something, they are drawn to weird parts of the picture. Like what really bothers me in that picture is the weight of the, the fold on the sleeve of that guy. It looks like he should be bringing his arm down. You know? and, uh, and also, it, facial expressions are really hard to remember because they're shocking. And immediately you develop uh, defenses not to remember those things or not to think about them. Patterns I don't even want to talk about. You cannot remember a pattern. So whatever I couldn't remember, I sort of faked it about. But I never looked at the picture while doing it. The drawings were so filled with white out. They were, they were done with ball pen. Every time I remember something, I would just draw. Sometimes I did things like I would call people and ask people, do they bought the coat of John John as he's saluting his father, you know, have six buttons or four buttons? Do the woman at Kent State shootings that she's like this, does she wear a scarf? Does she have a watch? Think about this. There's a number of things that you don't remember because the picture in your head is not clear. The picture in your head is fuzzy. And what I did, I created a, 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 something that would approach me, with, so something that we could meet halfway through. Uh, my gallerist asked me if I wanted to show these drawings. I thought they were very bad because they were too, too mixed, too many things in one drawing. The technique was bad. But I also had grown attached to them, so I had a really good idea. I take a picture of the drawing, I sell the picture, I keep the drawing. Good deal. So, but when I took the picture, I took the picture slightly out of focus to take the traces of my hands. And when I printed, I printed with the same half dot pattern that I had seen this picture the first time I saw it in a book. So it was a cycle going, it's a, going a full circle. I had seen this and I had made an image that just looked like it from what I, had, I could remember. When I showed these pictures, people were very critical of the printing, you know, but they really thought they were looking at the event, like you all remember this, right? Some of you, remember, some of you weren't even born. I also noticed that I have an uncanny tendency to, to uh, 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 how do you say, revert images in my head, which is a good thing because that's the only reason why all these uh, AP, Reuters, all the image companies never, could never sue me because the images are very different, you know. The image in your head, uh, really, it's a very significant part of how you see the world. Everybody here see the world different because you've seen, when you see uh, a picture of a chair, you know, that picture is, you see that through the filters of every single chair you've seen before and every single time you see, a, you saw a picture of a chair. So every time you look, even if you look at the same chair, you're looking from a different vantage point, you're looking from a different understanding of what a chair is. That subjectively lets me think about how the image in your head forces our imagination upon things that we see in the material world, like clouds, you know. I do this thing with my, my daughter, this, one of these tests. I say, look, they're all, they all look like seals. And then she's like, oh, dad, you just ruined them all, you know. Because once you say that, they all look like seals, you know. 
But one thing about what the picture in your head is that when you look at this picture, okay, you're looking at a cloud, a lump of cotton, and a guy rowing a kayak. But when you see the guy with the kayak, you, you forget the lump of cotton and the cloud. And when you see the cloud, the guy of the kayak and the, and the cotton go away. Because we have this uh, handicap called attention. Attention is something that we developed. And it, I, I think it's, uh, I have a theory that I have tested with some neuroscientists. And some of them didn't think that I was a fool. Uh, that we have bad eyes. You know, our eyes are designed, the design of our eyes are worse than the designs of eyes found in 500 million year old fossils of trilobites. That meaning we only see three degrees of like 130 degrees that the visual field accounts for. You know, everything else is, uh, it's a, it's a, a, a peri peripheral vision. Foveal vision is just three degrees. What the impression that we have that we see the world in focus, that we, our eyes move continuously, you know. And I think that's the fact that we move the eyes from one to B, A, A to B to C to D, we create a narrative that with, with the passing of time and the complexity that they acquired, they actually evolved into consciousness. Because if you want, will go A, B, C, you may wonder what D is going to go, you know. And so virtually we are intelligent because we don't see very well. <coughs> And, you know, here I am saying you should be more intelligent if you see a little better, right? But uh, the thing is, uh, the split, what you can do, what you do, which is interesting. Oh, I'm sorry. I messed up. Okay. Uh, you cannot see every, the three things at a time, but you, you, have, you can choose what you see. Like in the optical illusions of the mecha cube, that vase with the two faces, uh, this is a no thing. I didn't invent that. You know, you can see like in the, the doors of paradise, you know, this uh, uh, 1400s piece by Ghiberti. You know, it has all these 10 panels. They mix two types of technique. The high, uh, low, high profile, you know, like, a, uh, and, and, and then, which was something that uh, they, they did. Uh, you see that type of uh, uh, casting from ancient times, is something that you, you, you see throughout history. And then you see there was perspective, which was something that had just been invented, you know. When you have these two things together, it's totally overkill. And these images are very amazing, the way they sort of lock you in trying to figure out what you're looking at, because they have two conflicting types of representation harmoniously working together to make a scene. I really wanted to do that, but I didn't know the Pope, and I didn't have uh, 16 years to make a door or the money to do it. So I decided to do something more simple. I had wire in my house, and I made tension between two different uh, um, uh, te technologies. One is photography, and the other is uh, uh, drawing, you know. So and there's something about that. Uh, Pencil drawings, you know, something that they, they look like pencil drawings, but they're not. When you look at it, you'd say, oh, it's just a pencil drawing. And then you go, wait, wait a minute. It's not. It's a picture. Oh, it's a picture, but what, of wire. And how big it was. How long did it take? Is it three-dimensional? It... By the time you're asking this question, you're not just looking at something. You're thinking about the way you're looking at something. And this is what the difference, the main difference between an, an image that can be considered art and an image that's just an image. I think... Images, artistic images, they have the power of making you wonder about how you, why you understand how you see something, what you're looking at. You know, you try, they question your own position as a viewer. I, you know, we look at drawings, pencil drawings. It's very interesting. If I make a drawing of one of you, like, you know, with a pencil, uh, that drawing will be good or bad depending on how much it looks like you. But if I make the same drawing with molasses and have ants running on top of it, you're going to go like, how did you do that? You know, Probably drawing molasses is easier than drawing with a pencil. But the fact that it brings your attention to the process makes it all important. You know? And that's the main reason why I use these weird things. Also because you know, I always had the studio near the kitchen and near a box of tools. You know? uh, 
And then you photograph, they are like small pictures like this. I, I try to do landscapes with a wire, but the wire is very hard. So I started thinking about maybe the, the idea of distance that a, a line of thread offers would be something poetic to do landscapes with thread. So I, by accumulating thousands of yards of thread over a surface, you have the feeling that you created two types of perspective. One of them is pictorial, you know, which is the picture that you're seeing, and the other is topographical. You're just seeing the photograph, the accumulation, and those things really fight one another when you look at the picture. It makes you really interested in it, the, what you're looking at. So I, I named this. I also started using works by other artists because it creates another layer. So I want the work to be multi-layered, to make as many obstacles for you to get to the original image. So you really have to think your way through it, you know. So this is after Coho. It's, a, it's a, after a photograph that's based on, uh, it's actually something between a photograph is a cliché there and a print. In the museums, nobody knows where to put these things, and that really makes me really am fascinated by them. Uh, this is by Gerhard Richter, which is an artist that, that you know, depends... I, I've done a lot of work based on his images because he was an artist who, who, an artist who has used photographic imagery heavily. And it's beautiful to see something come from a photograph and go back to one. You know? There's something about, I, I named these pieces after the number of yards that I use uh, in the, to make the piece. So it's, the one is like 28,000 yards after Coho. This is like 10,000 yards after Gerhard Richter. And sometimes uh, you make this piece, which is like 50,000 yards after Ruisdale, you know? People buy that one, even though it's not that good looking, just because of the number of the arts. Um, I, this is 1992, I, I, have, I, I had to go back to Brazil to get my green card. I, I, I was an illegal alien, okay? For, for a few years I didn't see my, my father. So I went to get my green card, and by the time I came back, we were in the middle of a huge recession. I was about to quit my job as an artist and find a real job. Um, but I did something really important. I took like a vacation for the first time in a long time. Uh, I went to, I traded art for a, a, an airfare and some hotel time in St. Kitts, and I spent two weeks there, and I... I thought I didn't have a career anymore because I spent two years in Brazil, went to Europe. When I came back, things had changed so much. And I spent time with these children that didn't know how to swim. So every time I go to the beach, they would just come and go on top of me. And I became friends with them. The, and I took pictures of them. And I remembered their names and little things that they did. You know? But the, time, the last time, uh, last day of my trip, I, this girl, Valentina, she took me to have lunch in her house. And I got to meet her parents. You know, it was a Sunday. And her parents were bitter, wary, you know, the worn out people that didn't, I could not really think how these children could become those grown up people. What was taken from them? And uh, for the Brazilians know that are here, you know, it was a very important uh, poet that uh, passed away recently, Ferreira Goulart. It was the only book that I brought from Brazil was a book of his. And one of the poems is called The Sugar. And in this poem, he says where the sugar comes from. It comes from the, the store. It comes from the, the you know, the, 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 the plantation. And, and he ends up the poem saying, it's from the bitter life of bitter people that I sweetened my coffee in this beautiful day in Ipanem. I was, when I came back to New York, uh, I was drinking coffee, you know, and I was looking at the little pictures of the kids. And I said, yeah, we took sweetness out of these people in the form of sugar. And I just went to the, uh, the kitchen, uh, again, picked up sugar, and it started over a black paper. And then also, I think it, I was starting to be more familiar with the photo, photographic uh, medium. And that was one thing that allowed me to do that. A photograph is actually crystals immersed in some kind of gelatinous uh, uh, medium, right? And I, I made these pieces, and to my surprise, it was much easier to draw with sugar than to draw with any other, with a pencil, because it's cool, like, you know, and it tastes good. <laughs> so this is called the Sugar Children. I, I showed them at Trisha Collins' back room uh, in 1994, and a critic from the New York Times came and uh, reviewed 
to review the show in front, and he wrote a really beautiful piece about uh, Chuck Hagen, he, about the, the, the piece that he found in the back. Uh, sorry. Without these pieces, and I mean, I would, I think they saved my life, you know. In three weeks, I had a visit from MoMA, and I was included in the new photography show, which is a show, an exhibition that, uh, you know, features like new talent in photography. That moment, I became a photographer, and, uh, and I never forget, you know, and only two years later, I had my first retrospective at ICP. I made four times the work that I, that I make, I make four times the work that I had in that retrospective. You know, it was like a, a very early retrospective. And, but it was very important because at the day I opened, I had uh, um, everybody, you know, coming to me like a, 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 the, 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 the photo curator of MoMA, uh, Peter Galassi, Maria Morris Hamburg, the photo curator, of, uh, you know, we had Pierre Praxin, all these amazing people that were photograph, photography experts coming to me and they, were, they really told me that I was a photographer. It was very important to me. You know? But it's very, I come from a very poor family in Brazil. You know? um, a few years before that, you know, when I was doing those thread pieces, you know, when I started doing these works, uh, I remember there was a guy, a UPS uh, driver, he, he came, his name was William, he was from Jamaica. He once helped me bring a box to my third floor studio, and then he looked at one of these pieces and he said, what was that? Is this some kind of art? I said, I said, what do you think it is? I always answer questions with questions. You know? <laughs> what do you think it is? They said, well, I see the wall, you know, it's, uh, well, what is it made of? I said, what do you think it is? It's salt? cocaine, uh, you know, what, what, what do you think it is? By the time we got to this, you know, ordeal, you know, I told him it was sugar, and he really enjoyed it, and he said, well, yeah, I come from Jamaica. You know, I deliver things in all galleries. There's all these squares and round things. I don't understand anything, but this I can get to. Well, William, once he came, then he, every time he comes to the studio, William, uh, he, even if he brings an envelope, he looks at you, what are you working on? Can, I, can we come take a look? And then uh, I said, yeah, sure, man. So one day I had done one of those thread pieces because it was a show at Robert Miller Gallery, uh, and I wanted to have a gallery. I didn't have a gallery. You know? So I said, I made, but I made a big one because it was an important gallery, big piece, you know? And then he looked at it and said, oh, well, you know what, man, I don't like that one. And I said, why? Because, you know, before you made them the size, the thread was the size of the thread. And so now you made them bigger. You lost the relationship between the thread and the original thing. And I said, yeah, you know, I think, I, you know, artists make more mistakes than UPS drivers do. So I, but I, the piece is framed. It's going to go to the wall or the gallery anyway. So that night, I had the work in the wall. And I sat after in the dinner after with a, with a critic, very famous New York critic. This one, I'm not going to tell the name. Uh, so he looked at me and said, oh, you're Vic, right? You're the guy who makes those things. Uh, yeah. yeah, I kind of follow your work. I like it. Uh, but the, the piece, in, you, you, I, didn't, I didn't like it. I have to say to you, sorry. You know? I said, why? Because when you're doing them small, there was a relationship between the line and the, the other line. And now that you made them bigger, you lost it. I said, God, man, you got to be right on the dot because my UPS driver said exactly the same thing. <laughs> this guy never spoke to me again. But what I wanted to say is that when I had my first show, and, and it has to be doing with having a show in a museum, you know, I had all these curators and directors, and um, William came to my retrospective, and he, there's the seventh Sugar Children is a picture of his daughter. I made for him, and he brought a picture of his mantelpiece with a picture of his daughter in it, and to know that I was hanging in a museum and I was hanging in William's house, you know, and you know that these pieces now they are in the in the Tate collection, in the Met collection, the MoMA has them, and they also at the library in St. Kitts. That made a world of difference to me. And then since then, I never, you know, my mother, my father, they only set foot in my in, in a gallery or a museum because I was having a show there, and I was, you know, over it was when I was forty, you know. Since then, I've been making work for my mom. You know, I think it's very important. It's very easy to appear intelligent to erudite, you know, people. It's very hard for you to, it's very, the, the really drill challenge to make work that's intelligent for people who know about art history, know about art, 
And it's equally interesting for people who clean the museum or work in it, you know, doing security. So I, I, I think uh, when, you really, when your show really works is when everybody sort of like has a response to it. When you get like uh, the guards in the museum are asking you questions. They're like, oh, I like this. How did you do that part, you know? Or uh, also children, you know? Children that has been like, for me, has been a big part of my work is working with children. Um, you know a work of an exhibition is good when at the end of the show, the lower part of the frame is full of little greasy paws, you know, like this. <laughs> that they're like. Oh, you know, when you're doing the sugar thing, also I became aware of another, you can transcend the senses. You can actually make, when you see a picture of a McDonald's a burger or Burger King, it look, the picture looks very different than the thing you end up eating, but the picture suggests the taste, you know, and that's also another way of interfering with the picture. So I thought of what would I do with that would be very interfering. Chocolate is as much as a cultural invention as it is a, an industrial one. Chocolate can mean many things. You know, it's, it's full, it's loaded with meanings. It can mean uh, of guilt, obesity, uh, valentines. You can mean millions of things. So it was a perfect thing to work, to test. You know, also I was doing things that took too long to make. It was to, I could do very quick uh, tryouts. So I made people kissing with chocolate and people killing each other with chocolate to see how the tension between the material and the picture worked. The first person I made with chocolate was Freud because he was probably could uh, uh, explain this much better than I do. <laughs> and also, you know, the messy thing of like Jackson Pollock. Uh, a, 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 a scholar of Jackson Pollock came to me after a lecture like this. He said, it is really bad. <laughs> uh, you know, it's great. I have to make these things. Uh, they're small like this, and then the picture is as big as the, what you see here, but they're extremely in focus because I shoot them with an 8x10 camera. Um, you, I have to make them in less than one hour, otherwise the chocolate dries. So in the process, this is like so you see some sad people and some happy people in a, in a sports event. In the process, some people who are happy become sad, and some people, are, it doesn't really matter. You see that... that the piece that's, uh, you, you, you're going to like this because the piece that's on display here, I was working on that, Christ the Scent of the Cross by Caravaggio, right? And I was working on that, and then I, I made a plate of pasta, and the, the, in the following page, there was the Medusa of Caravaggio. So I was looking, and then I, the pasta didn't end up, it was too salty. So I, I, I made, I put some olive oil, and I made that thing. And since I had the, the, the camera ready, I just shot it, right? And this was Monday. And then uh, I have a friend named Leslie Tonkin. She said, oh, I have you. What do you work for the show? I said, what show? The show about apparition. You told me you'd be part of it. I said, oh, God, I didn't make anything. I said, really? You have to give me something. Your name is in the invitation card. So I gave, him, gave her that. <laughs> so in, uh, on Sunday, it was on the uh, Sunday section of Arts and Entertainment of the New York Times. It was two, two-thirds of a page. It was my, my plate of pasta. But you know, that, let me go back. This took literally three minutes to do, right? This is made of pigment, pure, loose pigment over a, a, a paper about this big. When I make this, I have to wear goggles, I have to wear a mask, because if I breathe out, I ruin the piece. If I breathe in, I die, because that's cadmium. Uh, and it, takes, it took me four months to make that. And I have to sell them for the same price. <laughs> you know, um, when you start making things about materials, what makes, especially today, where we're dealing with the immateriality of the image, it's interesting to think about what images were traditionally made of. You know, a painting is made of a pigment and a medium over a surface, a support, right? But sometimes when you separate this and make a picture with it, it makes you aware of the mechanics. For, for artists, uh, we're like clock makers, you know. When you look at a clock, there's a, the image has a, a utility, has a, a, a use, a, you know, and you see the time. We see all the gears that are in the back to make you able to see what the image is trying to say. But then, again, to what's uh, the image that's artistic, you know, some clocks make you, give you the time, some clocks make you think about time, you know. And uh, this, making a work that takes a long time to make is very hard. 
but you're very glad when it's finished. You know? Sometimes you make something very quickly and you're very happy that you had that idea so quickly and the results were so good. But I think that there are different forms of experimenting. Uh, a lot of these works are made out of the idea of color because what is color? You know, when you look at a painting, when you turn your back, you immediately forgot what the color that is. If you buy the book, I have a collection of 60 books on Van Gogh. I collect them because every single one of them have the same picture in it. The picture is different in every single uh, illustration. You know, uh, when you think about the painter, uh, I have a friend, James Hyde, who's a painter, and he said to me, in photography, you could never get the right color. And I said, well, painting, you can never paint with the right color because it's wet when you paint, when it dries, it's a different color. Unless if you're working with dry pastels and pure pigment, you don't have that. So I decided to work with pure color. But then I photographed, we changed the color anyway. So you're just making it, you know, just answering a question. Then you get the, the medium. Then I thought uh, paper is another thing. The, the support is something that's quite important. If, what if I make a picture only with paper? Yeah? I tried to make them only with white paper using the, the cutouts like I did the, to, to make line drawings like the wire pieces. But there was too much, they were too much alike. When I tried to make them with more grays, gray, there's no uh, standard, it's a, gray is not a, a, it's a relative value, you know? Like you, what you're looking at, this is black, but from what you're looking at, it looks gray. If I have a gray sweater on and I'm on a white wall, you look different than if I'm on a dark wall. So I had to need, I needed mathematics, you know? So I, what I did, I, uh, once I started like playing with Photoshop, I broke the grays in five grays from black to white and three medium and light gray and dark gray. And I created this really insane collage. They're photorealistic, but they're all cut by hand. So every single, and what, one thing you can do, you can reverse the background is on top. So the value of the picture, that's, the white is actually, when you look at these pictures, you see them on top, which is very confusing, you know. And since I was working with black and white, I decided to focus on the history of black and white photography. So these pictures from a, um, from a distance, you know, they look just like the original. Uh, they, they, in, there's one particular. This picture is really sharp. When you look at it from a distance, that girl, she looks like the most beautiful girl in the whole picture. But when you come closer to the picture, you know, in my studio, she looks just like a jack-o'-lantern. <laughs> your, your, your mind sort of like figures out and completes. There's the relation, you know, there's a, it's, a, it's very interesting how we have poor eyesight, but you have an incredible, uh, uh, you know, uh, visual cortex to make up for it. When I started uh, thinking about uh, materials, you know, I also think, what about doing things with objects? Uh, so I moved to a bigger studio and I said, well, I can make bigger things now. So I did these uh, drawings that, in perspective, they make an image. Uh, what I want to point out that I don't shoot them from above. I shoot them from an angle and I draw them in an anamorphosis. The drawing doesn't look like, the drawing looks, it's very elongated, and it's a trapezoidal shape, you know? But from where the camera sees it, it's perfectly uh, rectangular. And this is a picture of a, a child soldier, soldier for the Civil War, it was, it's based on a tintype, and it's, ba it's made of, uh, you know, uh, these army soldiers. You know, it's like, that kid should be playing with these things instead of going to war. I realized that, you know, uh, the, the toys are a medium. You know, you play with uh, toy cars before you drive real cars. You play with toy pens before you cook. There's something that is an interface between, and it, that made me interested in that as well. So I made several pictures that dealt with the idea of lying in a picture. Uh, with uh, that, And then when I moved to an even larger studio, I thought of making these things uh, with... Uh, some kind of material. I could not afford new things, so I moved my studio next to the largest junkyard in Brazil, is in Rio, and I could make these things with junk. If you notice, 
this, there are three pictures of the same space making, you know, in three different times. So, but together, they make the Botticelli scene. Uh, all these works are based on mythology, because mythology is based on moral tales, which is pretty much decide what's good from bad. If you notice, there are high contrast pictures. There are places where there is garbage and there isn't garbage. You know, our mind doesn't work like that. This is the ideal way to actually put a, a moral question. Our mind is not uh, so binary as these pictures. But uh, it's, you can tell the size of things. because you know, There's a piano, there's like doors, tires, and, they, and they're also anamorphic. Uh, the place where I work is roughly twice the size of this auditorium. And the pieces I shot from a 20 meter, 60 feet high tower. Uh, and it's shot from an angle too, which makes the, whatever is here, twice as big as what's there. Here, they're one to one. Um, you know, you could see like there's a piano here. Um, and it, it's, it's a lot of fun doing these things. In all of them, there's one blue basket that we put the small stuff is the signature. So we know, we, it always comes back the blue basket. You know, the thing about scale is very easy. So I was limited to the scale that I was working with. And I'm fascinated by artists like uh, James Turrell, uh, uh, Smithson. I'd never been to Spiral Jetty. I was invited many times to go. I, I'm afraid if I go, it's too small. It would destroy a sculpture in my head. Uh, but I thought, maybe I could, what is that about this? Because Smithson, you know, Heiser, all these guys, they made sculptures in our brains, you know, because they made it so far away. I always been talking about. I made works. Uh, I made. I had an exhibition at the Whitney Museum called "The Things Themselves," which was based on minimalism. And I'm always. I, I am a product of minimalism. Although I'm a Brazilian artist, I am influenced by art that was made during my lifetime in the United States and in Europe. But primarily, arte povera and minimalism are, are huge, because these modes of art making they reflect on the. They are. They are. They meditate on the poetics. Of, of the impossibility between concept and material. You know, they, they, the, 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 the substance, the, the poetics come from this friction between where does concept enter material? Is it, is it, does it surround it? Can you create a self-contained form? You know, there's so many beautiful uh, arguments that you can make just looking at a Richard Serra, you know, cube. You know, but because it's there. Sometimes I think that Richard Serra is not the best sculptor in the world, but he's the most sculptor in the world. Because he deals with, you know, when you think about people like Turrell dealing with pure light, so they, they're very synthetic, they, they're very economical, and they allow a lot of thinking into what an art object can be. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I had to understand this, so I had to make it in my studio. You know, that's me making it little... I tried to put a train in it, didn't work. The train kept going, ruining the whole thing. Uh, until I bugged a, a mining company in Brazil for four and a half years, until they let me, uh, you know, they, we actually, they, mining, iron mining, during about five, six years ago, they were selling so much iron ore that they had, the, the piles were low, so you have these huge expenses of fuel that you didn't have to, to, to clear. So I didn't have to cut one single tree. And uh, so I, I was so convincing, so persuasive. This is one of my great artistic uh, talents. That I convinced them to let me use these things, lend me the, the retro diggers and the helicopter. So we could make drawings that could be seen from uh, commercial aircraft. And you can still see some of them in the Itabira from Google. See this? But, uh, but I wanted to contrast the amount of work to do these things with the utterly stupidity of the subjects. You know, that they are really dumb drawings, stuff that you can find, because I wanted to focus. I didn't want to put Martin Luther King or, 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 or Che Guevara in it, because I want people to focus on the process itself. It, I wanted things to be utterly meaningless. Uh, see, that's, that's my assistant down there, but that's a small one. This is one of the first ones. See, that truck there, the bed of that truck is the size of this auditorium. I, this is my favorite one. 
because they changed the outlets in Brazil to the most stupid outlet ever, and I miss that so much. <laughs> I know the same thing, you know, because, you know, I was, saying, I was talking about shifts in material, but the shift in scales are very interesting because when you make a drawing so big that you cannot see it when you're on top of it, you have to imagine it. And then you go again to the picture in your head. Between the imagine and the physical, there is the space for thinking, the space for meditating. It's actually the space of freedom that Anton and Artaud talked about. It's when you try to find the connection between something that is just a thought and it's something that is physical, that's in front of you. This is the sublime in art. You know? uh, I try to pinpoint where is the sublime in art. And I go to the museums, I sit in museums. I'm a museum rat. I like museums that have benches with pillows because I sit on them for a long time looking at people, looking at art. And the way people look at art is very similar. You know, they walk. Well, it's a difference. You know, we receive images every day, a lot of them. Uh, when we go to a museum, we revert the flow of the way we encounter images. We go towards an image. We ritualize the, the process of apprehending an image. We take a shower. Some of us do. We pay the, you know, we pay the, t the bus ticket, we pay to get in the museum, and we go and we walk, and there's a picture there, a picture of a landscape, but you don't know because it's too far. You walk towards it, and you stop. Everybody drives the same thing, the same picture, and they go there. <laughs> Why do they do that? <laughs> because they do this because they are so beautiful. Go back to the museum at will. You can do this very easily. But there's something even more important. When the person looks at it, he sees something that is, and it goes back to my first definition of life, it's something that comes from an artist's mind. It's an invention. It comes from the mind, the creation, the creation of an art. And when he gets close, he sees the material which that idea was conceived. He gets, he, most of these things come from the ground. You know, they're like a, a you know, minerals, they're pigments, they're like uh, oils that come from animals. That the artist, with the talent, with his creativity, made it look like a, like a landscape. But it's, the important thing is not here, when he sees the mind part of it, or here, when he sees the material part of it. It's the fact that every time he goes back and forth, he crosses the threshold that separates what's out there from what's inside him. Whenever he crosses that, he feels that he goes through that very thin membrane, that barrier. That's the sublime in art. That's what we're looking at and looking for in pictures. Exactly the moment where our mind encounters, you know, the environment. And we feel it. You know, if we do that in pictures, in paintings, and you know, we can do it even more effectively in photographs where we can control the scale. But we do it through many techniques. One of them is estrangement. Uh, I'm very skeptical of public art because in public art, sometimes you, you bump into it, you know, they have to go around, some, some people may not like it. Uh, but, you know, I, I, they, I was commissioned by Creative Time to do public art in New York, and I thought I would just hire a plane to do uh, clouds in the sky. I did the first one here in, in, in uh, Tucson, in Arizona. Uh, I, it's really cool. These things, they, they, they move. So you're... You're expecting to see a cloud in the sky, but never in the shape of a drawing. So all of a sudden, you look, there's this cartoony cloud moving about, you know, not selling anything. You know, and you go like, what the hell is that, you know? <laughs> and it makes you think about clouds, drawings, and a number of things. And also, it makes you think about drawing, because uh, watching somebody draw is a really cool thing, you know? Whenever somebody's doing it, that one is terrible. It looks like a sombrero. But it was the first one. <laughs> now, whenever you, you look at, at somebody making a picture of some, a caricature of somebody you know, in the park, you see that there's one victim there. There's a crowd of people looking at how the drawing is made. So I wanted to make a drawing that everybody could see it at the same time. See, this is a much better one. <laughs> this one I made over Manhattan in 2001 in, uh, in the spring. 
So in September, they were the attack at the tower. So you won't expect seeing anybody drawing clouds anytime soon on top of Manhattan with little planes, you know. Uh, the funny thing, I wanted to do a cloud that just looked like a cloud. And then I received a letter from a couple that they had just lost their son uh, who owned two sports bars in Manhattan. Uh, and uh, he was a little league coach. And the letter said that when they, the, in the cortege, at the funeral of their child, you know, uh, everybody looked up and they saw a huge baseball glove in the sky. Uh, and I, I had to answer, I said, it wasn't me, it was the wind, you know. But uh, it's, it's even when you don't want to draw, to put anything, from, it, it, you know, you cannot do it. People are going to see meaning there. Okay, that is a very phallic cloud over Miami South Beach. <laughs> Dirty minds. Well, whatever goes for big things goes for small things. That is a fib. It's a focused ion beam machine. That is used to create and to fix microchips, but at the level of a nano level, you know? It's even like a, we, what I wanted to do is to make pictures that are so small you couldn't see it. They were invisible. So I team up with a group of people at MIT, and we had to draw software for that machine that could transfer some old drawings that I had done previously with something called Camera Lucida. Camera Lucida is a 19th, 18th century apparatus that allows you to draw what's in front of you reflected on the surface. So you can just trace it, right? People did that when they traveled because they didn't have cameras. Uh, I, it's an early 19th century, late to 18th century. So I, I used the 18th century, I team, you know, I crossed, used the uh, 21st century uh, technology. And I also, the idea of scales, you know. So I, I used that to print the pictures of the castles I drew with the camera lucida on single grains of sand. But uh, let me tell you something. This is not just a grain of sand. If this grain, this is almost like a grain of dust. This would go airborne. If this was this big, the diameter of a single hair of yours will be twice as thick as this room for you to have an idea of scale. At this scale, nothing can be cleaned, you know, because, you know, a brush would be 10 times thicker than this room. Uh, so there are 10 drawings. We have to, it's very funny because we, we use a, 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 a stream of ions to draw, the, to etch the, the, the picture into the grain. And then we have to transfer to an electronic microscope to actually uh, uh, picture it, you know. In between one and another, there's a little movement. So we spend sometimes as much as four hours trying to find the same grain of sand. <laughs> and the, when it's scanned, when it's scanned, the, the electron steam, the electron beams erase the picture. So we end up with a, with a grain of sand that we, we finish with another grain of sand. I made a picture of my daughter, Dora, my five-year-old, and I didn't picture it. Well, instead, I threw it on Ipanema in the, in the beach. So my hopes is when she's like 16, she'll be there with her boyfriend, and she says to their boyfriend, do you really love me? <laughs> Find me there. <laughs> also, working with MIT, I developed this uh, works with a, with a genius uh, a bioengineer named at Tau de Nino, we are able to do, this looks like a, the, the you know, wallpaper of your grandma's, but uh, it's a Victorian pattern, but uh, upon close inspection, you realize that these are liver cells, live liver cells. And they're not, this is, there's very little, there's not, there's not, we only use the digital camera sometimes to clean little things in it, but if you see that some of them, they have even two nuclei, you know. Uh, what we do, we make this uh, low-profile uh, casts, you know, that we have to do in clean rooms, and then we focus, focus the electron microscope below the surface, you know, and uh, of the low, low, low relief. And uh, we, we are able to leave the, the cells where we want them. In this case, uh, you know, the, the liver cells are sluggish, and they don't move about. They just uh, reproduce very quickly, and they fill the space very quickly. And I thought, well, great, I'm going to do it all kinds of cells, right? No. Uh, for instance, these are stem cells. They, they behave completely different. Uh, we did, I did a mandala with uh, cervical cells. They have cilia. They move about. So you have to scan different. So this is a process that's been taking 10 years to do. 
Uh, these are stem cells. I'm trying to do a circuit board like this with neurons. Neurons are very expensive. I, I, you know, it's obvious that it's but because they don't they don't divide. You know, uh, it's very, they're very hard to get. You know, they're very rare neurons. You know, <laughs> and uh, uh, it's funny that also optical uh, cells do not divide and cardiac cells don't divide. Either. And these are the most interesting ones. I'm not going to spend too much time on this because I really want you to see the film if you can. It's a, it's a documentary. If you cannot come, it's, a, it's, a, it's horrible to say that, but it's a, this bootleg on YouTube you can also watch. <laughs> but it's, nice, it's a nice film to watch in a theater. Uh, these are the people I worked with, and I asked the, a lot of what they, you know, a lot of the results of what we did had to do with working with them. You know, they were deciding what they wanted to perform, what they want to be. It's, it's truly a collaboration. So, and we made them with all these things. With uh, you have to watch the film; it's pretty cool. There's a part that you know, one of them come with me to an auction at Philips in London, where a photograph is, and I, I showed him uh, a Damien Hirst uh, work, and I told him that's worth two million dollars. You have to watch the film just to see his face. Okay, no trailer. When I, as I said, when I was doing that, you know, our minds are not like so binary that we have places that are clean and places that are dirty. We, uh, as I said about uh, Cezanne, you know, I'm trying to make pictures like we think about pictures. Uh, Cezanne painted the mountain. I do something different, not because I am a different artist. It's because my world is different. No, my, our picture of the world is, uh, has a, a holographic complexity. It's made of cross-references. They are dizzy. You know, we don't have a place to put it. Basically, our mind is pretty much like the garbage dump we saw before. You know, we don't know how to, to separate these things quite well. We are not educated or trained to do so. So, that said, how do we create pictures in our head? We just basically negotiate between background and foreground with uh, imagery that we have remembered, they have seen, and bits and pieces. That picture, trying to define the picture in your head has been my, my obsession for well, almost 30 years. You know, that said, when you see a zebra, you know, you see a zebra that is based on every single zebra you've seen before. Everybody's gonna see a different zebra. But when you see a zebra, that every single part of the zebra is made with a different image. So this is, you don't see from there, and I have to do this mimic. You know? it's, uh, every, in the original picture, which is about that size, every part of it has a picture in it, which is extremely distracting. You know, it's pretty much, it reflects the, the, the also our, our difficulty paying attention to things. When you look at this, you forget the zebra in the first three seconds because you're looking at other things, you know, like you you just like uh, your, your eye cannot concentrate on the main subject. Um, and you go through images that uh, I like to work with image, imagery that um, not only with materials, they are known, but also imagery, imagery that is familiar to the, to the viewer. As I said, you know, I want the viewer to feel comfortable and at first be betrayed by its own knowledge of what it's looking at. The reason I, I work with you know, all materials that are very, uh, you know, unorthodox it has nothing to do with the material itself. It has to do with every material offers me a different process, you know, and I can experience art making from a completely different perspective. Uh, it's not because chocolate's funny. It's just because if you work with chocolate, you have, there's a different way of working than if you work with diamonds, which I also did work. It's very hard to work with diamonds. I prefer to work with chocolate. Uh, but, uh, uh, and I choose the, the iconography based also on familiarity. They mostly, you know, icons, archetypes, stereotypes, because I want people to first recognize something that they've seen before and feel betrayed by it, having to renegotiate its relationship to the, to the uh, image. So then you, you see a little bit how the images are all little bits and, and the monads of meaning, you know. Um, I did that with magazines, but then I felt, it's funny, I collect 
uh, family pictures, you know. I, I, something else, I, I never had a photo class in my life. I was a teacher in many schools, and then I, I but everything I learned from photography, I learned from family pictures. I, when I arrived, when I was a kid, I was that kid, by the way. You know, this is me at two years old. Um, when I was that kid, my, my family didn't own a camera. And the only pictures I have of myself is when my aunt came from New Jersey. She lived in the United States. She would come and she would take pictures. And then the next year, she would bring the pictures. You know, it's not I, when I tell that to my kids, they laugh at me. It's like, what about the phone? Didn't she have a phone? <laughs> and I said, no. Uh, so as a result, I have nine pictures of myself as a kid. And when I came to the U.S., I started seeing pictures being sold in, in like uh, thrift markets and garage sales. I didn't understand how those pictures went uh, orphaned, you know. Because uh, one way that we, we used to uh, pass family albums with the same way we pass genetic information. So it was a pictorial information. You know, we knew how our aunt looked like or how our grandfather looked like. It was very important until recently, where everything is on a phone and we take more pictures than we are able to see it. Uh, I buy these pictures for 25 years. I have 260,000 pictures, right? And you, you, you make uh, groups of pictures. It's very interesting. And you make the groups based on the, your life. When you look at a family album, every family album is exactly the same. It tells the same story. It's a baby picture, a bar mitzvah picture, or, or a, a communion picture. And then you have uh, the, the, the school picture, and then you have the vacation, uh, and then, uh, you know, there's a wedding, children, buy more vacation, grandchildren, and then they end up somewhere. Uh, the only thing that changes are the, the protagonist and the, and the scenario, but the story is always the same. It's the story of our lives. And our, we punctuated the story of our lives based on our ability to record it. So... I, what I wanted to do is to actually make the pictures that are in everybody's albums, but with pictures from many albums. I was tired of looking at these boxes and boxes of pictures that I have that I don't have time to look at, and I wanted to revive them. I wanted to take them out of the box and make them meaningful and alive again. So these pictures are made from fragments from everybody's lives, you know? And I, 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 I started with my own picture. I always start with self-portrait because if it looks really bad, I don't offend anybody. <clears throat> And then, uh, you know, that I have a, a boxes of pictures of women on vacation. And there's, I have a, a special kind of, because when, you know, it, it, when women go on vacation, men don't do that. Men look straight at the camera. They look, they want, you know? but women, they don't look at the camera. They, want, they all look like Cindy Sherman film studio. They, they look away. They go like. There's like, it's a genre of uh, vacation photography, of like the, I'm not, I don't know you're taking a picture of me. <laughs> and that, that is a perfect one, too. You know, and I, I didn't want to make, the pictures couldn't, didn't, couldn't be anecdotal, or, or they had to be similar. So I couldn't, I had to pick a couple that was not great looking and not ugly. So you had to be a picture that you could relate to it, you know. <clears throat> the same thing goes for, uh, postcards. I collect them. And now they become cheaper and cheaper like the pictures. You can find thousands of them on eBay because nobody sends postcards. Everybody has Instagram. Uh, but there's something about the picture in your head that goes applies here. Uh, I, when I say Paris, you know, if I didn't show you that picture, if I was still here, everybody would have sort of think about that. It would have been a picture of Paris. You would have always the Eiffel Tower, a curve in the sand, you know, maybe some buildings. But the picture in your head, apart from the Eiffel Tower, which is a distinct shape, the buildings would be from, you know, from Phoenix, from London, from anywhere. You just put something together that looks like Paris, and you're satisfied with it. Uh, I wanted to make a picture like that, you know, that because when you visit Paris, it's different than when you see the postcard. It's, it's also experience of a place. It's always fragmented. So I made... It took me a long time to get the, the, you know, New York because New York in my head still has the Twin Towers in it. I, I, whenever I remember, they're still there, you know. I don't know what happened. Rio. I'm going to go through this. Sao Paulo. This is a really cool one, but my city is a very ugly city. 
And this is a recent uh, work that I did called Metachrom, which I went back to the, sometimes I just go back to, I, I forget to do th things, to do the idea of color, but then I'm using like bits of the pastel. Reaper is another idea. Uh, I made, you know, when Monet made these pictures of Rouen Cathedral, he made, uh, he painted the same cathedral at different times of the day. What I did, I painted, I, I, I made the collages from the same reproductions of the same painting. And they are completely different from one another. And finally, this is a, a, a series that I've been working for 15 years. There are many more. You know, this would be like a 10-hour lecture. I'm sorry. I, I, I told you, you shouldn't have come. <laughs> but uh, what I've been doing for 15 years, uh, you know, I started that in uh, 16 now. Uh, in 2001, I was with Lisa Denisor at the Guggenheim Museum, and they were doing, they were rehanging uh, uh, the, the Tannhauser collection. And then I saw something on a corner that really caught my attention. I said, is that the, the, the Irony Woman from Picasso? It was turned the back. And she said, yeah. I said, can I take a picture? So I took a picture. I said, can I come tomorrow and take the big camera to take a picture? She said, yeah. So I came, I took a picture of all the several works that were there, very important, Kandinsky's and Leger. And I, I and then, I didn't know what to do with that, but that immediately brought me back to a memory that I, first museum that I visited in my life was the Museum of Art of Sao Paulo. And uh, Lina Bobardi, the architect who conceived it, made something really incredible. She made all the very important paintings in the collection, the Velasquez, Raphael, Bosch. She put them on glass uh, easels that when you come to the museum, they're all facing you. So it's like every, all the paintings you can say hello to you. And the thing is, you don't go on the walls following the same sequence. You just go meander, and every time you visit the museum, it's a different narrative. But the best of all, when I was seven, I could see the back of the paintings, and they were, I wasn't interested in the front of the paintings, I have to confess. The back of it, they had like spider webs. They had things that sort of evolved. They are alive, you know, they something. And it, in fact, when the painter finishes a painting, what they call the varnish, the vernissage, you know, that image is supposed to stay exactly the same for centuries. The back, people don't care. People write on it. People put labels. People drill holes through it. You know, they put graffiti. You know, some, there's graffiti in the Mona Lisa. There's graffiti on, on the, uh, the Sunday in the Park by Seurat. People write to loved ones on it, you know. People really don't care. In the back, changes continuously because uh, conservative, conserva conservators' attitudes towards what, how to keep a painting alive, but the back is just as important as the front. Uh, what I've been doing for the last 15 years, I've been bugging people in museums. This is a starry night, by the way. Uh, to make, and what I did after I made pictures of them, what I did, I, I've been consistently uh, uh, doing I, I tried to work with the pictures, but the pictures were boring. So what I did, I worked with a set of professionals, carpenters, uh, forgers. And I, I'm, I'm keeping forgers out of the forgery job business, you know, <laughs> to do a perfect three-dimensional version, you know, a facsimile of the back of the picture. Nobody has done that before. You know, people fake the front of the picture. Uh, but it, so... For the Starry Night, we actually took the people, and then we worked intensely with the conservators. Uh, they, we, brought, we brought this to MoMA, and we put one side to the, next to the other, and nobody could tell the difference, you know. This is the Mona Lisa. It took me four years bugging the Louvre to do this. Uh, you see here, there's a, this thing is packed with electronics, and the Mona Lisa has a little, it's wooden, it's an oak board, it has a gap here uh, that all the structure here is to monitor the gap. If that gap widens one micron, somebody gets an SMS. The Mona Lisa has an IP address. Uh, the Mona Lisa is only it gets out of, the, of its scouts, like in the Louvre, the first November of every year, the first Monday of November of every year, and the people from Uffizi come, around 20 people come, and they take it out, they and they expect they put it back on. Uh, they, never more than 25 people, and then they don't let any uh, security or any even maintenance in the museum during that time. So if you have one of those badges, you can walk the entire museum by yourself. Nobody bugs you. 
It's a treat. So we did that. We finished, and w while we were doing it, we talked to so much with the conservators from the office that they kept visiting. We got the guy, you know, Paolo, who designed that for us to make it an exact working version for us. So it is, we had to buy a, a tree in, the ten in Tennessee to be able to make the exact uh, wood pattern of the Mona Lisa. I just did an uh, 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 anatomy lesson. We have to weave the canvas in which the painting was relying in the early 19th century, upstate New York, with an old uh, loom. It's a lot of fun. Some people like to tune cars. I do this. <laughs> but the best is like when we, after a year, we had to bring, they asked us if we could, for comic relief, we could bring the Mona Lisa in and out of the Louvre in the day that, you know, you have to be, uh, you have to be filed with the Interpol to be doing this. But, you know, imagine, it looks like a film. The day that they don't have any security or any, any you bring a box that says Mona Lisa, and you come out with one, you know? It, I love my job, you know, because I can hire and fire myself on a daily basis. It's so good. Uh, but, you know, there's something about this work that I think it reflects a little bit of what we said here. And I know we're running, up, you know, time. Um, what that does, it shows a very famous image as an object, you know? And maybe emphasize the fact that we still need to think of the material world, you know, as we've, it, it's becoming patent that we don't need to visit museums anymore. You don't have to come see my film here because it's on YouTube. Uh, the entire collection of the Prado, which by the way is my next, you know, and, and I just finished uh, The Kiss and The Embrace by Chile, The Kiss by Klimt, and now the next museum I'm, we're, we're working towards getting to do uh, Las Meninas, which it has the back of a painting in there. Uh, so I, one thing is, when you look at an artwork as an object, you know, it, the importance of it is that we're still in the business of uh, ritualizing visual experience in a way that uh, we feel physically involved with these things. Being physically involved with anything, I think it has never been as important as it is today. You know, as we delegate uh, our dialogues to, you know, to, to numeric interfaces, you know, we, do, we, not, we don't talk anymore. You know, we just talk, we just listen to what we want to listen. We're just being, uh, you know, polarized into groups that are based on what we think we want. And uh, we live in a very confusing world that's ruled by where our social uh, relations and even our picture of the world is being defined by algorithms. And uh, there is no counter effect to that, except, you know, people are thinking how to, how to fix, how, how to improve. There is definitely a deficiency between what, uh, in our relationship to the world around us, the way we perceive it or mental ecology of it. And while, you know, there's probably some sub subterfuges, like some, you know, some em emergential uh, 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 things that we can do uh, with laws and politics, you know, it's still, uh, there's no, we, we haven't really thought about it. In how, how can we improve the way we look at the world? And, uh, and while we don't have, uh, in our educational systems, there's still we're still dealing with media that was developed, you know, 3,500 years ago, and we barely, you know, managed to teach our kids how to read and write. Not to mention how to look at images. Visual literacy, I think, in a world that is completely uh, ruled by images, and when I say the, the image, the image of the basketball player, the image of the rapper, the image of you know, that, that really, it's, we don't have any knowledge of how to cope, or how to organize, how to create a system where we can organize this information, have discernment, and have even a little bit more time as a result. Now, the attention economy, as we call it, has been like the greatest uh, uh, subject of our time. And we are too busy trying to look at everything and we are not looking at anything. In a world that, you know, you have, uh, it's 
completely uh, uh, permeated with uh, surveillance cameras, you know, uh, ubiquitous internet, Wi-Fi everywhere. You know, you feel you have this weird sensation, this fake belief, and I'm talking about belief, you know, uh, that we are seeing we're everywhere. You know? And we forget that the person who sees through everything is just as blind as the person who sees through nothing. You know? Something has to change, you know, and I think uh, uh, we live, uh, a few years ago, I mentioned that, that the, when photography was invented, when it was declared invented, you know, in the July of 1839, the next day, all the, all the newspapers claimed that painting was dead. And in fact, painting wasn't dead at all. You know, we can buy paint today. We see paintings here in the, in the show that are as contemporary art. Photography liberated painting from its obligation to reveal the world as it was. The same way that digital imaging liberated photography almost 200 years later from, reviewing, from having to deal with the world as, as, as in its factuality. We, uh, I think, there has never been a better time in history to be a photographer because the photographic uh, uh, medium is completely obsolete, like painting was, you know, in the 19th century. But the same way the invention of photography prompted the, the question, what is painting? And painters started to explore not the subject, you know, the subject quality, but the relationship between ourselves and that medium. And in that exploration, we revealed so much about what we expected to our vision of the world. It's at the time of photography to do the same thing. And photography has a crucial uh, role in making us understand the world we live in, in a time that it no longer means anything else. Because the question is how, you know, that long story that I told you from 60,000 years ago, it's one unbroken line until very recently. What we've been doing, we've been polishing this thick wall that separates mind from the environment, from the phenomenon, from matter, throughout the centuries, until we get to this one little membrane. But it was still a membrane that carried characteristics from both the mind and the physical world. It was physical. We could hold it. We could say, this is me. And with digital imaging, it's like, almost like if the ghost of painting came to haunt photography in the form, ooh, I'm here. You have to deal with hue, color, all these values. Huh? It just did this. And we no longer we are, have uh, access to imagery that has no physicality. And that has done away with the uh, use, uses of, the, of what we would call the visual document. Our entire history is based on visual documents. Since the Paleolithic, what we've done, we've worked on the, sim the project of simulacra, the picture project, to the point that we made things that were so convincing that they lied better than tell the truth. The danger of that is that now when we look for authenticity in anything, we don't see it as a conventional visual trait of the thing. We have to look on the bottom to see if it's signed by something. We have to look in the back if it has a signature. Uh, a good example of this is money. We, when we see if, if money is good, it's not for what we look at, it's but for one machine that understands a certain code can tell you if it's looked at. You know, that machine that goes mm -hmm, like this, the soda machine that doesn't accept your money. Uh, so the danger is that what something we understood as truth was a matter of convention. Seeing is believing, right? Now it's a matter of ex exclusivity. It's a matter of uh, keeping people away. It's a matter of making a connection between a certain number of people. And that's very dangerous. I predicted, I mean, I, I hate to be the one that says I told you so. Uh, uh, and I, I very interested in the new generation of photographers today, I'm actually curating a show about this, that were born after, or were, were working already under the spell of Photoshop. But many, many critics and many philosophers, you know, like Jürgen Habernas, 
a lot of people were already predicting a crisis in reality, in the, the, the fabric of reality. And I think we're living through this now, and we have to learn. We're going to be okay, I guess. Because uh, we, we've, before, we believed in a reality that, was, that came from historical painting, you know? How do we go back to that? And that has little to do with the quality of the pictures we make and the more to do with the amount of discernment we have about our own beliefs. If we understand pictures better, if we, if we are encouraged to be in situations where we can think about pictures, like museum going, that's what it does. You, know? you think it's very important to come to the museum because you have a chance to have time to think about pictures which is something that dominates your, 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 your life. You know? If we do that, but also we need a little bit more organization, a more, more systematic way of thinking about it, uh, more than just an artist saying what he thinks. You know? uh, but we have to start very soon, because the results of living in a post-visual document world, in a world that things can mean just what you say, because many people are saying the same things, I already caused a lot of problems, you know, and I, I, I think uh, we are in a race for reality that we can't afford to lose. Thank you.